What, what do you I, think? I can start out. Oh, Bill, good, Josh. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, thank thank you all for your time and attention. Um, and uh, as as Bill pointed out, um, this this forum has given us opportunity so many times over the years to talk about the issue of affordable housing and homelessness. So I'm, I'm thankful to be here again. Uh, we are, and I, I think I've said this, probably just a broken record at this point, uh, we are short 28,000 units of affordable housing in the city of Cincinnati. Uh, and uh, as Bill pointed out, that didn't just happen overnight. Uh, we didn't go to bed one night, wake up the next morning and, oh crap, where'd those 28,000 homes go? Uh, you know, that didn't happen. Uh, what did happen is as a city, we have consistently decided to intervene uh, in the market, intervene in the system, if you will, but we do it in ways that benefit uh, folks that already have housing. Uh, you need only look at the microcosm of Over the Rhine. Uh, in Over the Rhine in the last 15 years, uh, Publicly and privately, we've spent approximately one and a half billion, with a B, dollars, primarily on housing. Simultaneously, in Over the Rhine, we've lost 2,300 affordable homes. So 2,300 of those 28,000 uh, were lost in that one neighborhood as we were pumping money into housing. Go figure. Uh, put money in housing, lose housing. It's because we're putting it uh, where, uh, where the need really isn't. Uh, and it is through decisions like that that have led to our 28,000 unit deficit. And this deficit has, uh, you know, it's one thing to talk numbers, but it has real consequences uh, for people. Uh, so <clears throat> in uh, just an average day in the city of Cincinnati, nearly 90% of families with children who call seeking shelter are turned away. Almost 90% majority, the vast majority get no assistance. And the reason is because the housing crisis is so deep that there are so many moms and dads with their kids uh, without housing that there's just not enough room in the shelters. Our public schools estimate that on a given day, 10% of Cincinnati public school children are without a home. 3,000 kids on an average day. And that is just the kids that we're able to identify with the five or so workers uh, for the entire county or entire, uh, public school district that do that work. Uh, you know, kids don't come into the classroom with it printed on their forehead. Uh, and the the fact is that uh, the experience of homelessness and housing insecurity, the constant bouncing from couch to couch to couch, often in unsafe locations, uh, often where mom pays for that couch with her body because she has nothing else left to protect her children with. In that situation, in those situations, the longer we don't bring a solution to bear, the longer that moms and dads and grandparents and hardworking Cincinnatians have to go through that trauma. And uh, it is high time uh, that we do something about it as a community. Uh, and so what we have um, put forward and, and we'll have the opportunity to vote on it, on May the 4th, uh, issue three, we'll put $50 million into the development and preservation of affordable housing every single year. And when we say affordable, we're using the well-accepted definition of affordability, which means you pay no more than 30% of your income for housing or mortgage uh, alone. And specifically, this amendment to our charter says that at least half of the money in the trust fund must be spent uh, for on housing that is affordable 
at 30% of the area median income or lower. That's roughly minimum wage. Uh, and we targeted that specific uh, income level because that's where the 28,000 unit gap is. Uh, all of the money must be spent at 60% of the area median income or lower. That's roughly $34,000 a year. And that $34,000 a year or less, that encompasses 41% of Cincinnati households. Uh, so the idea that sometime is cast to us that there's this other group of people that will benefit from this thing um, just isn't the case. There is no other group of people. We're talking just about us. So we're talking about uh, folks like nursing assistants and pharmacy techs, teachers just starting out. We're talking about <clears throat> uh, medical uh, assistants, cashiers, uh, bartenders, grocery store workers, uh, drivers, delivery drivers. We're talking about all of our, just our people, just our hardworking regular Cincinnatians uh, who are right now are fighting. We are fighting each other for the same um, and decreasing number of affordable units. Um, <clears throat> so I, I want to, um, before, I, I do wanna spend a little bit of time talking about um, some of the claims that the city uh, has made. Uh, but before I do that, I want to not hold the mic too long and make sure that Peg is able to talk, uh, especially from Mark's perspective. You know, Peg has shared that housing has been a um, priority for Mark um, since I think 1968. Um, so Peg. Uh, feel free to please talk about that. Well, um, so uh, Josh, uh, I think you've stated pretty much <laughs> why Mark is involved in this um, uh, passing of this amendment. So I, uh, um, Mark's history uh, goes back to 1968. I think out of our 50 plus years, um, housing has been a, top concern that's voted upon by Mark uh, members, uh, denominations and the representatives as a primary social concern for 25 years out of the 50 plus years. Um, and we've noticed as I think most Cincinnatians have experienced that in the last 30 years, um, the disparity of income is directly related to the rate of homelessness growing. And that's another reason why um, we're in this. Uh, this amendment addresses predominantly minimum wage earners um, and who need affordable housing. Um, so we, uh, Mark is, um, as most of you know, uh, its purpose is to work to improve public policy and in the process to uh, increase uh, uh, civil discourse. Um, so I think um, up until now, uh, the discourse has been fairly civil. Um, and what um, our amendment is asking is that the city uh, be creative in its response and innovative in its response to the 28,000 unit that is needed, units that are needed uh, of either to refurbish current existing housing and to develop new housing. Um, given our, our um, uh, the ballot issue and the language, um, we are looking at 50 million annually uh, that with leverage that could leverage other dollars. And when that 50 million is leveraged by for-profit developers and nonprofit developers, um, it can increase and can build or renovate at least 500 units of affordable housing uh, per year. 
that gets us halfway to our goal. So we're talking maybe 14,000 units in 10 years. Now, 20 years to achieve our full goal. So this, this uh, amendment that we're proposing in issue three is reasonable. It is sensitive to not overcharging. It, it just is signaling that there is a crisis and even under crisis, this probably right now is the best we can do. So I'll leave it at that. Josh, do you wanna continue? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, we we would we'd certainly like to spend most of the time talking about uh, how important this is and um, how much positive change issue three can make in our city, uh, but it does behoove us to spend a bit of time talking about some of the claims that have come from the city and from the um, opposition. Uh, first, we should be clear that uh, the, the need for affordable housing, uh, city council has not just recently been apprised of this need. Uh, this is not a new claim uh, we have been for years and years and years uh, pushing and pushing on City Hall to step up. Uh, and the urgency that people feel in our neighborhoods, our 52 neighborhoods, um, just hasn't translated to the folks at City Hall. Uh, and that is why uh, we have to do it ourselves. We have to take it to the ballot ourselves. Um, but in that context, uh, shortly after we uh, were notified by the Board of Elections that we had collected enough signatures to be on the May 4th ballot, um, and that was no small feat, 9,541 signatures in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, there were not festivals or gatherings or picnics to go to and collect signatures as uh, there would be in normal years. So. 9,500 people had to find a way to sign this. And I might uh, add to what Josh is saying, that Mark had a drive-through signing on Martin Luther King Day to honor the CDC rules under the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, those are the kinds of ways we, we had to come up with in order to um, arrive at that 9,500 signature limit. And at as those 9,500 signatures, which if you imagine that's, that's the equivalent of 9,500 voices arriving in front of city council, uh, 9,500 voices arrive and the city manager sends out uh, a memo to all employees of the city saying, look, if this thing passes, you're probably going to lose your job. Your department is going to have to cut and every department is gonna to have to cut until we reach $50 million in total cuts. And can you imagine your boss sends you and all of your coworkers something saying, your job is now on the chopping block if this thing passes. And you know that uh, your family, your friends, your, your children, your loved ones, uh, they, uh, need affordable housing. 41% of us are, are covered under this. You know that. But you also hear your boss saying it's going to cost you your job. Uh, that must be a terrible experience. Uh, and it is uh, very frustrating to us. And, and it is a sad state of affairs that the response from the city manager and from our city council, when 9,500 voices come before them, was to threaten our city workers and was to say to the public, say to us, so you want, a, you want us to invest in affordable housing? Well, if we do, uh, then expect, to, uh, expect road repairs to, to end, expect firefighters to show up uh, such that your house may have already burnt down, expect uh, that the, your kids' pools will close and the rec centers will close. That's, that is, uh, it's a threat. 
uh, and we have to see it that way. The fact is that uh, if you read the Charter Amendment, uh, which is available at Cincinnati Action for Housing Now, or sorry, actionforhousingnow.com, you don't need the Cincinnati part. Um, if you read it there, it in no way calls for nor requires the cut of anybody working for the city of Cincinnati. Um, in fact, it uh, outlines uh, revenue sources to build the $50 million, both new and existing revenue sources. So an example of an existing revenue source is proceeds from the lease of the Cincinnati Southern Railway. We own a railroad uh, and it generates between 17 and $18 million annually that is unrestricted. The city is now claiming that use of those dollars for the trust fund is somehow illegal. Uh, however, when we um, eventually got city council to pass an ordinance in December of 18, 2018, which established the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Shortly after that, in the beginning of 2019, city council put a small amount of money into the trust fund and it came from the lease of the railroad. So what two years ago, now three years ago now, uh, no two, two years ago now, what the city literally held a press conference about to celebrate this money from the railroad coming in they now say is illegal. We held a press conference to celebrate it. The mayor spoke, but now it's illegal. Uh, the, the other proposal uh, is uh, a developer fee. So in this forum, we've talked about this many times. Um, a developer fee is very simple. Uh, it's when you apply for your permit, you pay a percentage of your estimated construction cost into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. And in many municipalities across the country, these are referred to as impact fees or linkage fees. Uh, and the city is now claiming that, uh, they're not saying that it's illegal because it's not. Um, they're saying that it will be very difficult, uh, that it's not viable. Uh, but the fact is that there are hundreds, if not thousands of municipalities across the country that have developer fees. And one of the primary ways of funding affordable housing across the country is through developer fees. Uh, the argument that the city is making, um, in case you care about the kind of finite details, uh, is the city says and with that state law requires uh, if the city, if a city is going to charge a fee, that that fee uh, must be in place to pay for uh, the cost of doing business with that particular developer, right? It can't just be a fee for anything. It's got to be associated with the city's cost of doing business. And so therefore you have to prove that um, a developer uh, has an impact on affordable housing uh, in order to uh, charge a fee like this. Uh, and all of that is true. That is state law and it is true. Uh, and so just an example of how many other municipalities uh, make that connection is take the example of say a hotel. If you are going to build a hotel, so you come in and you propose to the city and the people of the city, we wanna build this hotel. We need some significant tax abatements, property tax abatements to do it. Uh, we need your support. Um, often, you, we will hear, uh, and one of the reasons you should support it uh, is because it, we're going to create jobs, right? We're going to create, uh, folks will work in the hotel, they'll work in the restaurants associated with the hotel, we're going to create jobs. Well, guess what? Folks working those jobs have to live somewhere. People have to be able to afford to live somewhere. And the, the fact that we do not have enough housing that is affordable, and now a company is introducing more people who need affordable housing, that is an impact. And it creates a need for the city to assist, which is a cost. And thus you have your connection.
And this is uh, the way it works across the country. We must be at least smart enough in the city of Cincinnati to figure out what hundreds of other municipalities are doing. Uh, they, there's been talk that this can only come from the uh, general fund. Uh, the the ballot, uh, the charter amendment actually cites both the general fund and the uh, capital fund. Uh, in fact, the way that some of the money, again, some of the small amount of money that is currently in the trust fund uh, came from the capital fund of the city. Um, so even though that is being ignored, that is where a small portion of the current money came from. Our total city's budget is $1.3 billion. 50 million is 3.8% of that. And that's without increasing revenue. 3.8% without adding any new revenue. The um, fact is, and you've got to, we just have to operate. I mean, we all know this, but we've got to operate with our, with our eyes wide open. Uh, I think there's a sense in many of our neighborhoods, 52 neighborhoods of being left out of the equation, uh, that there's a few favored neighborhoods. There's certainly a sense amongst many of our residents of being left out of the equation. When we see uh, significant property tax abatements and support <clears throat> going to luxury condominiums and uh, stadiums and and meanwhile we have literally thousands of families kids uh struggling to have a home uh it just it, it can't make sense to anybody uh and so we we just can't afford to fall for the false claim that if we prioritize our people and our neighborhoods, then the sky will fall. The city will not be able to function. Uh, and, and we will, uh, and our workers will be laid off. We cannot fall for that. The think about it like this, if this narrative of people will lose their jobs and will be laid off, that narrative is coming squarely from city council and from the mayor. It is not coming from us. And so the, we have to ask ourselves, are we really going to allow, as we make housing uh, a priority in our city, are we going to say, okay, sure, lay off our people? Are we going to say that? Are we going to allow that to happen? Or are we gonna say, as we have in the ballot initiative, no, we can increase revenue. We will increase revenue. We will bring in new funds and we will prioritize our people. Uh, we can do that, we must do it. Um, last year, more than 142 people died young in the city of Cincinnati because of homelessness. Their average age was 49. Over the last five years, we have uh, counted nearly 600 people who have died young. The youngest person on that list was two years old. Two years old. Somebody who was two years old lost their life because of homelessness in the city of Cincinnati. Can you imagine that? That's where we have gotten. We don't have time to argue with the city about whether or not we have the ability to do what hundreds of other cities have done. Instead, we need to focus on building 500 units of housing at least every single year in this city, creating thousands of jobs every year in this city to build and maintain that housing. That's where we have to focus. And we can keep our city functioning and functioning even stronger. So I've, as I tend to do, I've talked too much. Um, Peg may have things to say, and you all hopefully have questions and concerns and challenges. Um, 
I would like to suggest uh, we start taking some questions. Okay, you have, okay, sure, we can do that. Okay. Anybody uh, want to lead off with a question or a comment? Elizabeth Brown. Um, Josh or Peg, do either of you know who it is that are funding all these flyers? I have gotten five flyers in the mail saying I should vote no, um, all with just outrageous allegations of what's going to happen. And not what could happen, but what will happen, you know, um, if, if this passes, their threats. And who, who is behind that? It must cost a, an awful lot of money. I don't, you know, Bill Woods, you may want to ask uh, Pete uh, McClendon, who's funding the Flyers. If we got Peter McClendon. Saying, sorry, Bill, thanks. We keep since saying Safe Coalition. Um, we are funded mostly through the unions, the firefighters, the ASME, the code, and the um, uh, building trades. That's where we're getting the majority of our funding. And I appreciate listening to Josh and Margaret. And I believe we do need a comprehensive collaborative solution. And I just think issue three, rather than restrict the funds that they can get it from, I think we should expand it. Um, there are a lot of housing trusts that get funded in many, many ways developer fees, you know, different fees, taxes, condo fees, Airbnb. This unfortunately limits them to just the four sources. And I think we can do better. But thank you, Elizabeth, for the question. I understood that the Cincinnati Business Committee was also funding it very strongly. Is that true, Pete? There is some funding. I would not say strong. But there is some funding coming from the business community, yes. And from other groups too, we accept all donations. I know today, uh, today is the day that um, financial reports are due to the Board of Elections regarding the campaigns and contributors. So um, that will be another source for people to take a look at that, that's public records. So those will be available today, are you saying, Peg? Yeah, well, they have to be filed yeah. today. Yeah. By four o'clock. By four o'clock. <laughs> um, I will. Uh, just to follow up, um, and I encourage everybody, please, please go to actionforhousingnow.com and read the um, amendment language for yourself. You know, it's really only two and a half pages long. Um, and, and by the way, the attorney that we worked with to draft this is, is John Kirk, the former city solicitor. Um, I think that's of note. Uh, but when you look at it, uh, the we do we cite the the railroad we cite the developer fees uh, and we also include not only the general fund but the capital budget and what that does is it allows city council the creative space to uh, implement other forms of revenue that Pete is is uh, talking about. So what there, as he said, there are other ways. Uh, in the past, city council has talked about, for example, an admission fee, an admission fee to events. We didn't put that in there, but that would be completely uh, feasible within the realm of uh, issue three. Uh, and specifically, it's been talked about that private philanthropy should be a part of the equation. Uh, uh, I'm not sure that we agree that private philanthropy uh, but if folks do believe that, uh, that again, that can be a part of the general fund and the capital fund. Um, so there, there is not the only limitation that we put in there. The only limitation is that in order to raise the earnings tax, the income tax to pay for this, they must go for a vote of the people because we figured that regular folks, we didn't think were the right place for these dollars to come from. Uh, that's the only limitation. Uh, but I'm sure there's other questions. So Josh, I have a question. This is Mary yeah. Carol, hey. good to see you. You too. So uh, Mary just put this in the chat too. I think there are questions about why the, um, the limitation on using any federal dollars 
for this in yeah. what the rationale was behind that. So that's another limitation to it. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, thank you for that correction. Uh, yes, so this is the reason that we, that we put that limitation on not using federal and state dollars. Uh, it is because right now and for years, um, each year the city gets um, some amount of money, primarily from the feds, community development block grant dollars um, and home dollars being the primary uh, two examples. And those, especially in the form of home dollars, have to be designated to affordable housing. And honestly, we didn't want to allow space for uh, different administrations over the years to take money that is already required to go into affordable housing and throw it into the trust fund and say, oh, look, we met this portion of the obligation and that not therefore not actually represent any increase in funding or any new available funding. Uh, that's, that's why we put the limitation in there uh, because uh, if we, you know, I, I'm, I'm just this, don't quote me on this number, but say that $3 million comes in from home funds and it comes in no matter whether there's a trust fund or not. Uh, if that 3 million was a part of the 50 million, then the 50 million really just becomes 47 because we had the three anyway. Thank you for that explanation. I really had not heard it explained the way you just did. So I appreciate that. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Other, other questions? The, um, Alice Schneider has a question, Bill. Oh, no, Alice, good. Yes, last night I watched you on the Grayton, Grayton Head. Very good. Would you, uh, again, um, speak a little more about the people that will control the funds. Um. Sure. Yes. Um, so the charter amendment outlines um, an 11 person oversight board, uh, community oversight board. Um, and back in December of 2018, when we finally convinced council to pass the ordinance that created the trust fund, there was a second part to that ordinance, which uh, said that the council will follow up by establishing revenue for the trust fund, by establishing processes to use the money, and by creating um, a community oversight board. The second part of that ordinance never happened. Uh, issue three takes care of that. Uh, and the oversight board, the 11 person oversight board, uh, is to be uh, nominated by various organizations, including of, uh, of the members of affordable housing advocates, the members of the homeless coalition, uh, the board of housing opportunities made equal, the uh, membership of uh, home base, which is formerly the uh, known as the Cincinnati Community Development Corporation or association, sorry. Uh, and, and two nominations from the president pro tem of council. Uh, and the reason that we set it up this way uh, is because we wanted to have a board that would be accessible by regular folks in our city. So right now uh, we have boards for the, uh, the park board, the planning commission, the Board of Health, the Recreation Commission, those are all boards, similar boards that exist now. And in a number of cases, um, like with the parks, the health and the rec, they oversee large budgets. But those boards, uh, majority of the folks on those boards are appointed by the mayor, by one person. One person, council has no say in it, it's one person that makes the appointment. and. It just didn't seem to us that probably most uh, Cincinnatians felt any real connection to those boards or would even have an idea of how to access them. So we wanted to design something where you could directly or with very few degrees of separation, you could have the opportunity to serve on this, this, this board, 
have the opportunity to take part in the various coalitions that nominate people to the board uh, and that you would feel connected to the board. Uh, we still have in there that the approvals uh, uh, happen by city council. The, uh, the nominations are uh, done by these various organizations, but the approval is by city council. Uh, and the board then will have to work with the staff of the city's uh, community and economic development uh, department. So uh, in, a, what, in a, just a practical sense, the, the, the board will uh, put out um, you know, requests for proposals to the general public and developers and private citizens, pro for-profits and non-profits um, will reply to those requests with the ideas that they have. And then that board uh, will work with the staff of the city to determine, are these ideas uh, viable? Uh, is this uh, an organization that we can trust? Um, and then we'll decide whether or not to, to fund them. And then we'll follow up to uh, ensure that uh, everything is above board um, and that the house housing remains in good functioning, healthy, safe order. So, thanks, Alice. Oh, also, Alice, a response to that question, the current proposal that the city just announced in the last 48 hours, um, they state in their proposal that the mayor and council will appoint people to the public board. So in our charter amendment, that's our language. Um, we say that city council will appoint, they will approve um, the nominations and and they in turn challenged us, our amendment, with the same statement um, all the way up to the Supreme Court because we didn't use the term may, we used the term will appoint. So essentially they're, they're snipping bits and parts uh, that they were uh, formally against uh, prior to their coming up uh, with this um, new plan in the last 48 hours. Other comments or responses? That, um... There is something in the chat room. Uh, yeah. Why is there no end date or reevaluation requirements? That's a yeah. Thanks, Nikki. Great, great question. Um, so the this is the lack of housing and the and the trauma that it causes for thousands of Cincinnatians is of such urgency um, and the need is so great, 28,000 units of housing that, uh, and, and that urgency, as I've, as I've said, has been communicated time and again to City Hall. We've had so many people show up to City Hall and say, look, I'm being priced out of my neighborhood. I'm being forced out by this developer We've had people show up and say, you know, don't give away these tax abatements unless it includes affordable housing. And despite all of that, uh, we don't see significant movement or urgency coming from within those city hall walls. And so it made sense to us, let's not put a sunset on this thing that is so urgent because if, if at some point, uh, and, and we long for this day, if at some point we reach the time where we have we have used our resources, we have generated new resources, then we have built and preserved enough affordable housing to where we no longer need this measure, we will all know it and it will be a joyful day. And we will be able to go out and collect the 9,500 or 10,000 or 12,000 signatures to put this back on the ballot and take it off and we will all celebrate it. Uh, but we're not near that now. Uh, and, and so we, um, we long for that day, but we're just not there yet. I believe Carolyn Miller, or I think there was a question, chat room question from Carolyn Miller. Yeah, so how do you respond to the issue of possible conflicts of interest between the board members and the projects which might be funded? Uh, yeah, good, thanks. So <clears throat> if you read the charter amendment, uh, the, these organizations that are doing the nominations 
Um, first, it's important to note that none of the nominating organizations are also developers. None of them are. Uh, and they, uh, they are supposed to nominate folks that fit certain uh, criteria. So for example, people uh, with uh, low, low incomes who, who rent, people who own their home, people who are uh, knowledgeable in the development of housing, knowledgeable in fair housing. Uh, and that's just a few examples. Uh, so there, there is no inherent conflict, if you read the language, there's no inherent conflict uh, present. Uh, and in fact, the, the, this, this board, this community oversight board will have to follow the same rules that any other board in our city follows, whether it's the uh, board of health, the park board, et cetera, uh, and any board any of us are on now. Uh, that if, if you have a conflict of interest, uh, a financial conflict of interest, uh, then you can't be a part of that decision making. I think we all live within those, those realms. I know I regularly sign uh, con uh, conflict of interest disclosure forms. Um, so it would be, there's nothing, in, no inherent conflict. Um, and if an individual did have one, uh, we'd have to deal with it just like we do any other board. Other, other uh, comments or questions for either Peg or Josh? Um, yes, Elizabeth. I just, this isn't so much a question as just really to remind people that early voting has started, um, you know, we're it's a well into it. Starting next week on Monday, the Board of Elections is open until seven o'clock in the evening for people to go and vote. And then it will be open the weekend, um, the Saturday and Sunday, May 1st and 2nd, um, over the weekend also for early voting if folks want to um, encourage others to go in and vote early. Um, I, I find it a lot easier than, than for a lot of people than waiting until election day itself. It takes sort of the uncertainty out of it and allows you to choose your own time. And the people are really pleasant down there. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, my wife and I have taken advantage of that, driving over to Norwood and voting uh, in, in person there on those early voting days. And it, you can get in and get out very easily. So I recommend that as a way of voting. Other, uh, uh, yeah, John? Uh, yeah, I'll just, I, I want to add, Peg mentioned um, there's been some news in the past 48 hours about the um, press release the city put out that the city plans to put funds into affordable housing. Um, and so, one, uh, you know, we want to be clear that um, the city deciding to, to finally do something significant, uh, potentially significant for affordable housing, um, it's good. It's unfortunate that it takes all of this to, to get there, uh, but also want to make sure that that everybody understands the details of what they're saying. So when they say thirty five million dollars, what they're actually talking about is applying for a loan from Housing and Urban Development. It's a it's a loan from the federal government that we would apply for. We may not get approved for it. If we do get approved for it, it'd be $35 million one time. We'd have to pay it back with interest. And so we would be then asking uh, landlords and developers to pay their property taxes, pay the insurance on their building, pay their workers a living wage, uh, pay for um, the maintenance of the building, and also pay back a loan with interest and keep their rents low. That's what the city is bringing to the table. They are also bringing to the table that they will ask private philanthropists to donate an additional $30 million, um, which we think is great. Please do ask for that. And if, they, if those private philanthropists donate that much money, um, that fits fully within issue three. Uh, because issue three allows for 
um, receipt of money through the general fund and the capital budget. And the general fund is where such a donation would go. Um, but the other so challenge to that is um, we don't know, and, uh, and it would be important to hold landlords feet to the fire regarding that loan. Um, HUD income markers include 80% and higher of the average me median income. Uh, a lot of the folks that this initiative would help, at least the Charter Amendment initiative would help, are folks 60% um, and lower of the average median income for a household, it's around $34,000. We commit to 50% within uh, the 50 million to be focused on 30% and lower and the rest 60% and lower. With this loan, there are no benchmarks that commit to that. So what can happen and what has happened recently on Elm and Liberty is it's 80%. And that does not meet the needs of our, um, um, oh, what do I want to say? Of our, uh, uh, our employment. Yes, yeah minimum employment wage. Um, so uh, we've got the very people that we're hoping to help more than likely would be left out of that formula. So minimum wage earners is what I was looking for. Uh, one, one thing I wanted to interject before uh, this ended was that we've had to deal pretty much with the specifics of the amendment today. Um, I think the website that you the, you all created in terms of the uh, campaign has some real human stories on it. Uh, what's how do how do people get to that website and some of those stories? Because I think they're a very effective selling point for why we need this amendment. Yeah, it's and I put it in the chat box, but it's actionforhousingnow.com. And if, if you have trouble, you know, with that link, you know, put in your search engine, Cincinnati Action for Housing Now, then under that will pop up uh, the link that Josh just mentioned. And um, just click on it and you're there. You know, I, I want to just add something because I'm, I'm, um, yeah, I, I, so as I'm, as I'm looking at our virtual room here, I, I see, um, I see Pete sitting there and I see um, some other names associated with um, AFL-CIO and other, and, and unions. And uh, I, I think it's worth saying that to my knowledge, um, you know, and I've not been around perhaps long enough to say this, but to my knowledge, um, I don't think AFL-CIO and the Homeless Coalition or Mark um, or AHA have ever been at odds with one another. Um, I don't think we ever have been. I think we've always seemed to be on the same side in the same room. Uh, and, and so uh, despite the uh, the way things look right now, uh, it is important that, uh, that we do two things, that we vote yes on issue three, and that as we vote yes on issue three, we are uh, belligerent in our uh, stance that uh, we will not uh, allow our city council to uh, harm our city's workers in any way. Uh, we are that we are belligerent in our in our belief that we can do both. Uh, that's where we stand, uh, and we do not support the uh, stance of city council members.